Great to see me. Yes. All right. Well, thank you for being here. I'm Dan Birch. Come to you from Dallas, Texas, and uh, with the Silicorts. And next year, Silicorts will celebrate their 75th anniversary in the synchronization world. They started at one time as a part of the Swatch watch company in Switzerland. So now we operate on every continent. And this year earlier, we merged with Adtran Corporation. So headquarters is now in Huntsville, Alabama. So I'm filling in for someone today. Egal Pinishoff was supposed to be here. He unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, he's a much younger, better looking man. And uh, when the company found out that you didn't care what we looked like, they said, oh, well, okay, then you can go. So here I am. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, AP, about p and Assured p and you know, we, we are a very acronym heavy industry. And you know that an acronym is cool when the government starts using it, right? I was just in Washington, D.C. meeting with some uh, military leaders. And they all talked, they were all P&T, p and p and Like they really knew what it meant. It doesn't mean past noontime. Right? has a different meaning. So we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Now, what's the problem to begin with? You've probably been bombarded with this in every presentation you've ever been to, and so you're well-versed on it already, and the problem is the over-reliance on GNSS or GPS specifically here in the United States and all the areas of our life that it affects. Now, as we look at all these, and they've, they've already been well-addressed here this morning already, you know, the energy sector is one of my verticals, and the interesting thing is that Everybody assumes if GPS goes down, the power is going to go off. That's not true. I mean, we talk like it's true. Um, now, you'd have problems load balancing and you'd have problems switching and so forth with SCADA networks, but the power generally is generated and it's going to stay on unless something happens that they can't control. So, but all the others, communications especially, transportation, a lot of these others are impacted immediately, very critical. So we know the problem, what are the vulnerabilities? And maybe you've seen this chart as well. Um, I'm going to point to, I have to stop here for a second, folks. I come here from Texas, and they give me this itty bitty laser pointer. You can't, even, you can't really even see that, right? That's not a laser pointer. This is a laser pointer, okay? <laughs> All right, so now we can see what we're doing. So as we look at the drawing, and you look around the edges, you'll see that some of these interferences are, are common and some are rare. Some are emerging, but what are the biggest ones we have to deal with? Well, certainly jamming is number one. Spoofing is becoming more, but it's a little more sophisticated, so we don't worry quite as much about spoofing outside the military world. Yes, in the military, the spoofing goes on all the time. They want to draw ships off the channel. They want to make planes believe they don't know where they're at. Spoofing, daily occurrence, thousands of occurrences a day. When this phenomenon first became, um, it, we became aware of it, we had customers calling all the time saying, my GPS keeps going up and down. Well, then we find out they, they had a building that was near a shopping center. And teenagers and, and truck drivers and other people had discovered that, you know, they watched these TV shows where the FBI, the next day after something happens, the FBI says, we can tell everywhere that car was yesterday. And they're like, nobody's doing that to me. So they buy these little jammer devices, plug them in the car, and it kills GPS in, a, in an area. So nobody can, the car doesn't know where it is. So if the car doesn't know where it is, they can't tell the FBI where it was either, right? The problem, of course, is they take these things and they drive into the airport or they drive next to a substation, power substation or communication center, and they kill GPS all around that area, and then they leave their car parked. Here's the interesting thing about the United States of America. It is not illegal to own a GPS jammer. You got it? It's illegal to turn it on. Only in the US, right? You can own as many as you want, you just can't turn it on. So these are the common external things that are happening and we won't go into detail on that. And there's also things inside. There's people trying to send, use worms and transmit worms into GPS receivers now. So they wanna come in through the outside and try and destroy and, and disrupt. Why do they wanna do that? Just because it's fun for them, right? No practical purpose. And of course, once the signals are on your network, if you've got vulnerabilities in your network, then they can be manipulated as well, disturb your timing. It, we're not making it up. It happens every day. We lost DFW Airport for a day. We lost Denver International Airport for a day. We have all these other occurrences happening, certainly in wartime. It's happening all over Eastern Europe right now with the, you know, everybody's jamming each other, thinking, well, they're not gonna find me, right? So it's a given. We don't have to exploit that too much. Okay, so what is the acronym? What is resilient APNT? PNT, position, navigation, and timing. Where am I? 
How do I get to where I'm going? And what time is it? Of those three, timing is the most critical because the other two depend on it. So if you mess with timing, the dot's the wrong place on the radar and the car goes down the wrong road, right? So timing is critical. It's very critical. Um, and again, this slide just shows you a, a, the A, the assured means if you listen to me and the other fine vendors here and you follow our prescription for designing a synchronization in your network, we assure you you're going to be fine even if GPS goes down. That's all it means. We assured that you're going to be, that you're going to live through an outage. So the Department of Homeland Security developed some guidelines for you. There's a government edict that says you should uh, use GPS responsibly, which means don't harm the economy or our safety if GPS goes down. So DHS went a little farther and they said, okay, we've got four levels that we would like to tell you you need to achieve. And those four levels are based on something called your risk assessment. So if you've got an office that's out in the middle of nowhere and there's unlikely that GPS is ever going to be disrupted, you're going to apply one strategy. If you're in a town or in an airport, you're going to have greater risk, so you're going to design more robustness and resilience. So on the left, at the, at the very high level, you want to prevent something from happening. If you can, and there's ways to do that, if you can't prevent it, you need to respond quickly. You don't need to wait till the planes are calling saying, hey, we can't find the airport, we don't know where we are. And then you need to recover. You need to have some mechanism that comes in. And the assured part means you don't have to recover. You might see that something happened, but as a network, it says, I don't care if something's happening, but I'm still fine. And we'll see how you do that in just a minute. Four levels, <clears throat> we won't go over those in detail, but they're basically, we're moving to a multi-reference world where instead of having one or even two references, we're gonna have multiple references and our clocks are gonna be smart enough to decide if those are good references or not. You know, I usually start this story with a man goes into a bar, but everybody thinks I'm gonna tell a joke. So it, a man owns a bar. A man owns a bar, Are you with me? He owns a bar and he's sick and tired because he gets questions all night long. All night long, people are bothering him, he can't get his work done. And the question is, what time is it? Because they need to get out of there. Their wife doesn't know that he's at the bar, right, or whatever. So he says, I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna stop this once and for all. He puts a clock on the wall. It didn't stop any questions. Now, those of you who are smarter than me, already ahead of me, probably know what the questions are, but the question merely changed from what time is it to is that clock right? Didn't stop any questions at all. Our clocks today are smart enough to know if they're right. And you'll see a drawing about that in just a minute. So how do we apply this assured uh, PNT? Well, it's gonna start with an antenna that is at least resistive to jamming. It's an up tilt. I don't look down because usually jamming comes down, so I'm looking up, which you should be looking up anyway, right? Right, Keyshawn? You should always be looking up. And then you're gonna have a receiver that also has some intelligence so that it can determine if those, if those messages coming in are proper. Your clock itself is gonna have algorithms that help detect that. And I think everybody has those. You're, you're in luck because we have some great timing vendors here today. Everybody's products work. We don't have to talk bad about our, you know, we're in a business where we can respect each other. That's, that's, that's so great to be in a business where you respect your competition. And then you're gonna use your network also to help back up the local devices. So, well, I missed one. So one of the devices is called an EPRTC. It's kind of like putting an anchor, right? You're, you know, if you think about a shopping center, usually shopping centers have an anchor tenant. They have a big store. It used to be Sears or Pennies or something. Those are all gone. But because they had an anchor tenant, the little stores benefited, right? But once that store, that big store left, the others were in trouble. So what we want to do in your network is establish an anchor. We want to say, we're going to harden our network and we're going to be self-sufficient. So if GPS goes down, who cares for months? So we have this device called an EPRTC. EPRTC, as you can see, couples a cesium clock with a grandmaster clock, but there's an important function called a combiner here in the middle. And what it's gonna do, it's, it's, it's brain says, I don't trust anybody, so give me as many references as you can and I'm gonna start watching them, right? And I'm gonna decide, hey, if they're all the same, this, this looks pretty good. Now, they, they're not all gonna be wrong. If they're all wrong, we're in trouble but they're not all gonna be wrong. But as I'm watching and this one starts moving away from the rest of them, I'm not gonna pay attention to it for now. I'm gonna say, I'm not gonna use that until it cleans up. 
So it's seamlessly just be calm, be cool, and keep my outputs going the way they should be. And the references are to be an EPRTC, you'll see there's a lot of numbers up here, but the goal was to hold within 100 nanoseconds accuracy to UTC within 14 days. Well, we're all way past that. We, do, we all do way better than that today. So the goal is 100 nanoseconds in 100 days. So the goal is to keep you safe for 100 days should you lose GPS. We're there. So these prescriptions are all ready for you. And the way this worked in the old days, we'd have on the, on the left hand, you'll see, that was the early EPRTCs. We had GPS, PTP, other inputs, and we had a cesium. Well, the thing that we've been chasing for years in, in, in timing industry is accuracy, right? For years, nothing changed. We had a pizza box and an antenna. We had T1s and composite clocks, so we didn't worry much about accuracy. But it seems like every time we achieve a level of accuracy, they come out with a new network that needs better accuracy. So we're patting ourselves on the back and then going, we got to do what? We got to be 30 nanoseconds now? We just did 100. How are we going to get to 30? So we're chasing it always. So what the Department of Energy is telling the power companies, if you look on the, the other side, is they're going to do clusters of cesium. So they're going to have, you know, clusters of cesiums and multiple, as many inputs and references as you can get, and then the clock is going to decide which one is the best, and it's, it may use all of them, right? The more they have that are accurate, the better the whole accuracy is. But you've got multiple backups so that, and let me tell you something, we always talk about holdover oscillators, should it be rubidium or crystal or smart crystal. If you design this right, who cares what kind of holdover oscillator you've got, because you're never going to use it. You're not going to fall back and say, I don't have anything but this. You're just going to use one of those other references that you already have. So it's multiple references. And what we're doing here today is we're working in TAP, right? So we've got these timing appliance cards now. And you'll notice they've got a GPS receiver. They've got multiple inputs. So you could have PTP coming into this. You could have one PPS coming into this. You can have G GPS, multiple input references. Now, how do we deploy that? This is just a very simple drawing. So again, we're going to establish in our core of our network a 30 nanosecond accuracy with what? EPRTCs and GNSS and STL from Satellis and all these other references that we can find. So we're going to establish a 30 nanosecond core. We're going to transmit it around our network with DWDM or Sonnet or uh, not Sonnet, but MPLS over Sonnet or pure MPLS or whatever you're using. And then around the core and on the edge, you'll notice that some of these devices have GPS antennas and some don't. So the ones that have GPS, they have GPS as an input and they also have PTB coming off the ring, right, off the network. So the idea is, again, at the very least to have two. That's level two of the accuracy for DHS, right, a minimum of two. A holdover oscillator is not a reference. Not, the government doesn't consider that a reference. It's a holdover. So two references. So if you look at this drawing, and by the way, in 15 minutes, you can't go in too deep in this stuff. So if you need more, we'll help you anytime you want. But the, the end of this is that we've always been chasing accuracy. We're going to shift you now from thinking about accuracy to reliability. We, the accuracy we can achieve, the reliability is what's killing us right now. So we want you to move your thinking on the tap side to thinking about resilience. If you look down the list there, you know, you've got, how can you do it? Well, you've got both LEO and GEO satellites now. You've got, you know, ELORAN's making a comeback or trying to. Unfortunately, it'll probably be a service-based thing, but I loved, ELO I loved LORAN when it was out. I felt bad when it went down. High power, low frequency, goes through buildings, little rubber ducky antennas. It's great. It's going to make a comeback or it's trying. It already has in other parts of the world. Uh, new systems from NAV, the beacon systems of NextNav. So you've got all these things coming. Some are on now, some are beginning to become available. So in the next few years, we're going to have a lot of references that you can put into your network. So if GPS goes down, there's some companies say, I want to be totally off GPS, totally off of it. I want everything else I can get, a drop from NIST on a fiber that's UTC, and distribute that. So, but again, it starts with having that core that we built, talked about and employing the right protocols, and that's another discussion, there's PTP protocols that are intended for a WAN, and there's some that are intended for a LAN, and unfortunately, some people are trying to use the LAN and the WAN, and it doesn't work, and so we help them with that. So these are just the final observations on where we want to go in the TAP side, 
And with that, I think I've reached my end. Um, again, if you'd like to get in touch with me, there's my email address. I've got a number of white papers on LinkedIn that are very easy to read. I like to take difficult subjects and make sure you can understand. I'll never talk over your head. They're all in there. Daniel B. Birch on LinkedIn, you know, find a note and get in touch with me. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel.